Well, our political editor, Christopher Hove, managed to finally get Nigel Farage to just sit still in one place for a little bit, uh, and he cornered him for five minutes and asked him a whole host of questions, uh, and we have very gratefully been able to get that turned around for the start of this show. So that's quite enough for me from now. It is time for me to throw you over to the main men, our political editor, Christopher Hope, and the one and only Nigel Farage. Mr Farage, the biggest cheer that happened in your speech there it was at the end when you said you don't care about skin colour, orientation, we care if you share the values of this country, we judge you as a person. Why do you have to say that? Because we're sick to death of being divided up. We're sick to death of our kids at school at young ages, if they're white, being told they're oppressors, if they're black, being told they're victims. This whole division um, in society, the uh, equality, diversity and inclusion agenda, uh, which now discriminates against majority groups uh, in, in workplaces or joining the Royal Air Force or whatever it may be. We hate that. We don't believe they're consistent with British values in any way at all. And, and the reason I got the biggest cheer for that is you can see what a thoroughly decent, open group of people these are. Do you worry that that language might be seized on? You mentioned skin colour and orientation by, by people who think that you are, you'll say you're not, but a far-right party, well, 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 a racist well, 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 party. Well, well, I'm, I'm sorry, you've just contradicted yourself in the most extraordinary way. If that got the biggest cheer, how on earth can we be far-right? Mm. How on earth could we be? I mean, earlier, Lee Anderson talked about feeling like our culture get out. So what culture does he mean? Is that a white culture? Or what no, cu culture? culture? I mean, and, and, culture? and Middleton talked a lot about this. Mm. You know, it, it's about our history that shaped us in the way that it has. And whilst it may not be perfect, it's something we're proud of. Um, it's about the democracy that we've built. Um, it's about the universal values that we share. It's about understanding that it is the Judeo-Christian culture that underpins everything that we stand for. Um, it's not difficult, this. Mm. Critics see it, though, as being uh, excluding groups, but it's not in your world. It's the opposite. It's the opposite. No, 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 no. It's the DEI culture that excludes various groups and says, oh, you must employ this person over that person because they're X, Y, or Z. We're against all of that. You said the sky is the limit. Uh, Zia Yusuf, who's your chairman, he's told us on GB News that you can be win two terms. Not one term, two terms in the 2030s. Uh, he, he does run away a bit, doesn't he? <laughs> is, this, is this even possible? But from where you, you were a colleague at GB News before the election, you thought you'd go back into Reform UK, you won five seats. I mean, can you really win 321 seats to give you the majority in the House of Commons you need? I've never lived through a moment in my life where absolute disappointment and dissolution uh, with, 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 with the two parties, uh, people are... People are uh, uninspired in every way. They vote for one because they can't stand the other and vice versa. I mean, even this massive Labour majority hasn't come with any love. Uh, so if ever there was a moment when something big and historic was going to happen, it's now. Now, look, is it probable? No. But you asked me a different question. Is it possible? Anything's possible. What are the odds, then? You're a betting man. Eight to one at the moment. And you, you put money on 81. Well, that's what the that's what the that's what the bookies say. That's what the bookies say. That's what the bookies say. But can you really be a PM? I mean, have you got all the qualities you need to do it? I mean, you've you've run, I suppose. Well, I'm not, no, I haven't really. I've not been to Oxford. Um, I, I've, <laughs> I've, I've run a private business. Um, I have a sense of humour. I'm probably disqualified. Um, but look, Chris, you know, point is, in the next five years, yeah. it's probable that somebody younger and better looking than me will come along. And if that's... So it may not be you taking the next election. No, no, but, it, but, it, but if I can help propel us in that direction, um, and if nobody does come along that's better, then I'll have a go. And your new constitution means that members can vote out if there's a lack of... Well, the new constitution fundamentally changes the shape of the party. Mm. You know, it was set up as a company that I owned. I did it and I explained to the audience why, to stop us being taken over by malign actors. I mean, and believe you me, the far right, the genuine far right, would have come and tried to take it over, and now's the time, this party's come of age, to give it to the members. How do you do it without data? Uh, this party, this, this hall is on a sugar rush of that excitement from July, no question. But how do you get past that? You won with a, a divided, exhausted Tory party against you. They will be organised, you know they'll be organised in 2028, 2029. How do you beat them? Uh, by organising. You know, I mean, what is the th this conference is all about saying to them, I, I made it very clear in my talk, you know, we will succeed and fail, not on what I do, on what you do. There's only so much you can do with air war. Mm. You know, you can put out big national messages, you can uh, talk to you, you can do social media, you can do all those things, but ultimately, 
you know, it is on the door, uh, that it really matters. And the Lib Dems have proved that, I think, I think quite remarkably. So the staging posts towards you becoming Prime Minister are what? How many seats winning next May at the local election? We'd need to, we, we need to win several hundred seats next May. Yeah, uh, yeah we really would. And then the Welsh Assembly election? Go into Wales, Scotland and all the rest of it. Again, dozens in each, each of those seats? We'd need to... Well, I think dozens in Scotland at this stage would be a bit bullish. It takes time. It took well, time for you to win Brex the Brexit battle, didn't it? It will take time, this, perhaps more than... Uh, do you know, the Brexit, the Brexit battle was harder than, the, than this is going to be. Uh, this is about the desire for something different, uh, a feeling that we failed, uh, that the country is not working. And yet, despite thinking those things, look at the optimism of our people. They genuinely think something can happen. And just finally, who's your inspiration? Is Donald Trump giving you any advice? <laughs> I did speak to him on Monday after the second, after the second of course. assassination attempt. Um, uh, he always encourages me. What's, it, what's his key bit of advice for you? That'd be me. Be you. Nigel Farage, thank you for joining thank us you. today on GB News. Thank you. OK, so that was our political editor, Christopher Hope, there, with Nigel Farage, leader of Reform UK. I'm going to bring my panel into this. Now, Susanna, I'll start with you. One of the first things there was about um, uh, diversity, inclusion, etc., followed by another question, which was something Lee Anderson had raised mm. at the conference here, which is, and I'm paraphrasing here, which is essentially, if you don't like Britain, you know where the airport is. Mm. Is that fair enough, do you think? Well, you know, one of the things that Nigel Farage has always said, one of his mantras is, we want our country back. And that is a line that's peppered through his speeches for as long as I've known him. And... This is also a phrase that I hear very often when people are talking. They say, we do want our country back. They recognise that Britain has changed. You know, we had Labour since 1997, which deliberately allowed mass uncontrolled immigration. Yeah. They said at the time to rub the nose of the right in diversity. They wanted to change the way our country looked. He also mentioned equality, diversion and inclusion. Now, in my view, when I was at school say, many, many years ago, I didn't feel that our country was racist in any shape or form. I think, the, the, you know, things have definitely changed from the, from the 50s and 60s yeah. when you first had new immigrants. But since diversity, equality, inclusion has come in, he's absolutely right in what he said. Everybody's become much more divided. Uh, everyone's wandering around, talk, wandering around on eggshells, frightened of upsetting anybody, frightened of saying okay. something wrong. Become... So he's right about that. And, okay. and the, the face of the country has changed. There's no doubt about that. Okay, Patrick, and it makes I'm... it much less cohesive. You, you crack mm. town. You look like a man who definitely does know where the airport is. <laughs> um, but you decided to come back. So, so that's great. Um, do you think it's fair enough to just say, basically, look, if you don't like it here, stop trying to subvert British culture. You can leave if you want. Otherwise, just get on board with it. I think that's a perfectly fair thing to say, but it's not really a policy, is it? Mm, so yeah. Lee Anderson has got a bit of a talent for saying these things, and he did when he was in the Tories. But but the challenge for reform is is to come up with some considered policies, which could, in, you know, are they going to deport people who came illegally or people who came and then uh, committed certain criminal offences? What's the plan to do that? Uh, what is the immigration policy uh, looking ahead? But I think it's a very hot-button issue at the moment... Mm that every single identity group is encouraged mm. to wallow in victimhood, to try and get one over the others, apart from white working class people, right? And, and uh, they're not allowed to say, well, actually, you know, our teenage daughters uh, are running the gauntlet here or uh, working class boys are not getting into university. Uh, that's an invisible issue, particularly, I think, under this sort of North London Labour mm. uh, government. And, you know, Robert Jenrick's got a sense of this in, in, in his yeah. head, hasn't he? Mm. But, but uh, Nigel Farage, Lee Anderson kind of own the anti-woke thing and they're wise not to let it go. OK, Ma uh, Matthew, I'll bring you in on, on that. Do you think that there's some truth to that, that what Nigel Farage is saying there is owning the anti-woke thing? And him and Robert Jenrick talking both really about being proud to be English. The other thing I thought I saw you shaking your head a bit at during that VT that was about this notion that he could win in 2029. So do, do you find that ridiculous? No, I... Basically, he was talking... The bit I was shaking my head at is he thinks that somebody younger and fresher may end up coming along before him. And I think because of Nigel's charisma, whatever people think of him, the party will die a death when he's finished. I mm. don't see anybody at the moment that can fill that vacuum that he would leave, and it'd be a big vacuum. Mm. Yeah, no, f fair enough. Um, on the actual substance of the, some of the things that he was saying then, when it comes to, you know, people being taught that they're a victim or mm -hmm. uh, anything along those lines, do you, do you think that he's, he's talking people's language there? Should, should the Labour Party be fearful of him saying things like that? 
I think the, the party should be fearful of Nigel, and if they're not, you know, they're daft to, to consider him as, as not a threat. Um, I mean, I went to school, you know, a little bit more recently than Susanna. I never got told who was victims and who weren't, or, or whether people were racist, or told about how awful the country was. I'm proud to be British. Mm -hmm. I see the world in a very different way from Nigel, but I've never seen... The, the, the almost myths that seem to perpetuate much of public life that were dividing people. And actually, Nigel's divided a lot of the country in his own way as well, so it's a bit of reap what you sow at times. Mm. Do you think that Nigel could go and be Prime Minister in 2029? I mean, that was probably the other really big line that came out of it today, I think, which was that they are saying... Uh, openly, we are preparing for victory at the next general election. Okay, number one rule of politics never admit that you might not win. That yeah. is absolutely something yeah. you're not allowed to do in politics. So, personally, I think being Prime Minister in, 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 uh, in four or five years' time is a little bit ambitious, but I would love to see Nigel Farage as the leader of the opposition then at the dispatch box because he would be absolutely brilliant. And then I think he'd certainly have a chance at the next election after that if he still wants to do it, mm. as if he says someone younger and prettier hasn't come along or whatever it might be. Um, but, yeah, I, I think they've got to be so careful, though. Reform has still got a long way to be professional. Uh, when I joined UKIP in uh, 2013, I was really quite shocked, having been in the Conservative Party, just how so far away that party was from being anything like remotely professional. Yeah. And in a sense, reform is the continuing continuation of that legacy. So I really, really want reform to do well. And my message is please don't mess it up because well, he, the country needs you. He, he made a big point during his speech today of saying that one of the big things that they're going to do from now on is absolutely vet every single candidate. You can tell that for Nigel, the worst case scenario would be standing at local elections or the general election or whatever. And it turns out that some absolute complete and less a nut job mm. with a mm. track record of goodness knows what has managed to wander his way or her way into the party. And mm. so, so, so there is this desire now to try to professionalise it, isn't there? And there was a rallying call for everyone in that hall, which did look incredibly full, I must say, to, to try to play their part themselves. So, so to, do, you, do you think he might be successful in that, or is he always going to succumb to the odd nutter? Well, I think there'll always be the odd so-called yeah. uh, nutter, and in fact, most of the parties have them. But mm. Nigel parties yeah. <laughs> tend, to, tend to get more scrutiny because it's a way for both the, the left and the right to try and keep him down. I actually think the public despite uh, reform's problems with selecting so many candidates so quickly mm. at the election, I, d I think the public is kind of in, in the share price a bit. And, and the idea that Nigel is an extremist, yeah. I think he, he showed with, with Brexit, he actually was in line mm. with the majority of the mm. country. And I think, personally, that's faded away he's, a bit. He's got the charisma, he's got things that, that frankly, Keir Starmer doesn't have. Just very, very quickly, Matthew, one of the things for you as well is Anne Whittacombe was up there, she was talking about uh, when Labour have released all these prisoners, Prisoners um, out to the streets, some of whom miraculously have managed to find their way back into prison in the last <laughs> week or so. But um, what she thinks should have happened was that we'd turned holiday camps into secure prison like units. It's almost like halfway houses. Uh, yeah, it's things like that that I know might sound a, a bit silly, but I, silly, I think that would resonate quite well on the doorstep if they actually did them. Is it, is it that kind of policy thing that Labour's missing out on? If anybody that's ever stayed at Butlins thinks it's maybe a prison camp anyway, you know, so it, it wouldn't make much of a difference. Sorry to Butlins. Um, no, I think... All prisons, I, I oh, Well, quite, yeah. No, I think uh, people may like that. We have a country that believes in being very tough on crime. And actually, New Labour did that. They, they were in talks about opening up uh, ships to put uh, overspills mm. of prisons on, which I wouldn't, you know, think is a good idea. But th there's a narrative there, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how it pans out. But, um, yeah, certainly the way things are going for Keir Starmer, and we're going to be talking about, about that later on.